You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Now, I don't know much about American history, but just imagine if the modern Paul Revere started riding down the road saying the robots are coming, the robots are coming. Skynet, the Terminator, and all things artificial intelligence have always been linked to some sort of apocalyptic conflict. But artificial intelligence isn't just something from the future. It is something we are seeing now. But what does this mean? Well, it means a lot of stuff, but I don't know any of that stuff. So I'm going to ask someone. G'day listeners and welcome back to the Dead Prussian Podcast. It is good to see you in 2018. Thank you very much for all your support on iTunes, the reviews, uh, the emails, and also to our patrons on Patreon. Yes, that's right. We have a patron scheme where you can join the community as a member. And we have uh, Legends, Legends Plus, Legends Plus Plus, and Legends Plus Plus Plus, or Legends Double Plus and Triple Plus for those last two to make it easy. Uh, jump on www.patreon.com slash the dead Prussian if you want to check it out. Now, my guest today is Elsa B. Kenya, and she's an adjunct fellow with the Technology National Security Program at the Center for a New American S- Security. Here, she focuses on Chinese defense innovation and emerging technologies, particularly artificial intelligence. Her research interests include Chinese military modernization, information warfare, and defense and science technology. She's an independent analyst, consultant, and co-founder of the China Cyber and Intelligence Studies Institute, which seeks to become the premier venue for analysis and insights on China's use of cyber and intelligence capabilities as instruments of national power. Her prior professional experience includes the Department of Defense, the Long-Term Strategy Group, FireEye Inc., it's a really cool name, and the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Elsa is a graduate of Harvard College, where her thesis on the evolution of the PLA's strategic thinking on information warfare was awarded the James Gordon Bennett Prize. And while at Harvard, she worked as a research assistant at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Elsa was a Boron scholar in Beijing, China, and she is fluent in Mandarin Chinese. But more importantly, she's just written a paper called Battlefield Singularity, which is going to discuss artificial intelligence and military capability through a Chinese lens. Elsa, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for inviting me. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have someone with magical frost powers on the uh, on the show as well. So if you ever want to be able to snowman, just uh, just let me know. Oh, no. Uh, for the record, uh, I happen to be named for a dead Prussian ancestor, my great grandmother, uh, rather than the movie Frozen, which I still resent has unjustly appropriated my name. So... Please don't tell me to let it go. <laughs> that, that was actually my next joke, so I'm just going to have to scrub that one off the cards. But Elsa, before we discuss AI, I'm interested to know more about how you found yourself studying and writing about the development and application of uh, technology in military capability. Sure. So my background is primarily focusing on Chinese foreign policy and the Chinese People's Liberation Army. I have a long-standing curiosity about innovation. I'm also a big science fiction fan. So when I was in DC, starting to follow the discussions on the US third offset strategy, my, given my background, my initial thought was how, how China would respond and how the US pursuit of defense innovation could impact uh, China's approach to military modernization. So I started off looking a little bit at China's perceptions of and responses to the third offset. And that led me to looking more closely at Chinese defense innovation and emerging technologies, especially artificial intelligence. And from there, I started to try to develop a more granular understanding of how the PLA uh, thinks about and is approaching 
military and defense innovation in this domain. And I think it's certainly uh, Chinese defense academics are very closely st studying the U.S. third offset and related defense innovation initiatives. And I think it's important that the U.S. approach and pursuit of this agenda is also informed by a more careful look at how China is responding and adapting its own approach in real time. Mm. So this all links uh, towards your paper I mentioned before, which you've written called Battlefield Singularity, which is an awesome name. Um, and this, this paper focuses on the military revolution in China and, and particularly the development of AI. Uh, can you perhaps start telling us about um, the Chinese ambitions for AI in the military sphere? Sure. So uh, first, with regard to the name, a Battlefield Singularity was my attempt to come up with something catchy that did not include the word dragon or phrase with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> so hopefully I succeeded in at least being a little bit creative there. And the phrase itself was actually inspired by the writing of a Chinese uh, defense academic who was speculating and evaluating the potential implications of AI for future warfare and wrote about anticipating the potential coming of a moment in the future when the advent of AI in warfare and the greater use of robotics and intelligent unmanned systems could result in a point where the human mind is simply unable to keep up with the pace of operations, which could result in a singularity of sorts on the battlefield. So I thought it was sort of a compelling phrase and a compelling uh, concept, especially against the backdrop of China's very avid pursuit of an ambitious agenda in AI that could advance the sort of technologies that could make that potential singularity a, a reality within 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 our lifetimes perhaps i won't make any predictions about about the future but i think certainly it is clear that china is pursuing a very ambitious all nation agenda in artificial intelligence uh, this july china released the uh, new or next generation artificial intelligence development plan which called for china to lead the world in AI and become the premier AI innovation center in the world by 2030. And this plan uh, articulates a very massive focus on developing AI industry in China to $150 billion by 2030, and also investing in next generation, next generation research and development in this domain. And the strategy itself, uh, remains to be seen how its implementation progresses and how realistic some of these aims appear to be. But it was clearly a indication of the, that, that the Chinese leadership is prioritizing AI at the highest levels and they're willing to devote billions to research and development within this domain. And to some degree to speak of China's rise in AI has almost become a cliche. It's no longer quite so unexpected. It's certainly by most metrics you can look at in terms of patents, publications, both quality and quantity of research, it's clear that China is emerging as an AI superpower, so to speak. And I think that it will be fascinating to see how the implementation of this and related plans progress. I, I've i been trying to track all of this as it evolves in real time, which has made writing and finishing this report <laughs> challenging. I keep joking that this is this is still my rough draft and subject to revision as new things continue to come out. But even within the past month or so, it's been interesting to see the launch of the implementation process for this plan, which included a total of 15 different government agencies, including uh, including elements of the Chinese military. So the Central Military Civil Fusion Development Commission, which is led by Xi Jinping, which is responsible for advancing an agenda of military civil fusion that could, can leverage the synergies between military and, civil, and civilian applications of dual use technologies on the national level, as well as the Central Military Commission's Science and Technology Commission and its Equipment Development Department. Mm -hmm. So a clear sign that the certainly the certainly China's rise or emergence in AI is going to have tremendous commercial implications. The Chinese private sector has been leading China's AI revolution so far, and the Chinese state is now trying to take advantage of that dynamism in the private sector to advance China's national competitiveness, and also at the same time, 
to leverage these dual use technologies to enable new military capabilities. Hmm. So uh, it's interesting you, you talk about uh, you talked about the Chinese military or the, the People's Liberation Army, and you also talk about the the private sector uh, driving this to start off with. Um, it almost sounds like you need your own little. Uh, own little AI uh, to help you keep up with the uh, the pace of change in this area, but if only <laughs> how... that would be helpful. Yeah, I th- would all love a little uh, a little um well maybe not a HAL from two thousand one Space Odyssey because that was a murderous robot uh, or space shuttle I guess. But um I'm really curious to find out uh, now that the military seems to be catching up with the corporate sector. How does AI fit within the strategic thinking of the PLA? Sure. So so to start with a couple of caveats, uh, the PLA is not monolithic. Its thinking on these issues will continue to to evolve, as will that of the U.S. and other militaries. So I see this paper as sort of a snapshot of some of the perspectives that are being articulated and some of the discussions and debates that are happening in the Chinese context so far. So a lot of the writings and sources I draw upon are not fully official, but are reasonably authoritative, and have tried to provide a f- fairly balanced look at how, for instance, the I mean, U.S. discussions on the third offset in defense innovation are a little bit easier to get a sense of than those in China, and have tried to at least provide a initial look at how PLA strategic thinking is starting to look at what is considered to be a new military revolution. And China's high-level focus on defense innovation predates the third offset. Xi Jinping has been, himself has been talking about the imperative of of advancing military innovation since about mid-2014. So there's clearly a high-level impetus behind this. And fairly high-level PLA leaders, including the lieutenant general who leads their CMC Science and Technology Commission, have talked fairly openly about how they see AI having a tremendous transformative potential to change the character of warfare in fairly fundamental ways, could result in a need for new operational concepts and organizational structures to go with it. So in certain respects, how the PLA looks at this uh, seems to be informed by quite a close study of U.S. thinking and U.S. initiatives with the third offset. But there also there also seem to be some interesting, interesting differences that may be emerging between how China and the U.S. Uh, are looking at this. So, for instance, in a U.S. context, there has been quite a deal of focus on the imperative and importance of keeping humans in the loop. Of course, we can debate and raise questions about what having a human in the loop actually means in in different contexts, but you've had very high-level U.S. military officers saying that we will never take humans out of the loop, we will never let machines kill on their own, there's Mm. important to have a human element. And the PLA seems to take a little bit more of a pragmatic approach to some of these questions. There is a recognition of the importance of the human element in the machine age of warfare, that the introduction of complex AI systems and new technologies could result in greater demands on human capital, including requiring new types of training and greater technical proficiency. But there also seems to be a emerging recognition among those Chinese defense academics and PLA officers writing on this, that AI could change the speed of operations and the dynamics on the battlefield in fairly disruptive ways. And perhaps, I mean, again, to the notion of a battlefield singularity, perhaps in certain contexts beyond the capability of humans to remain directly involved in every single decision. So perhaps one analogy could be the application of the concept of mission command to autonomous systems that you there's a degree of delegation in a sense. You don't have the human commander of the AI system, so to speak, involved in every single tactical decision, but the system could be operating within overall mission parameters and guidelines. So we talk that humans might end up taking on more of a supervisory role, no longer quite on the front lines of the battlefield, but still having ultimate authority. And what this looks like and what's feasible could depend upon different operational contexts. So for instance, we've already seen very high degrees of automation introduced in air and missile defense. I think within the near future, we could see similar trends in terms of cyber operations. And yes, I think, so it'll be interesting to see how these debates continue to evolve in the US, China, and other militaries going forward. 
But I think there, there is a real possibility there could be clearer divergences between their approaches to some of the critical issues that, that will arise with the introduction of different AI techniques and applications in a military context. Yeah. So I think it will be important to understand how these debates evolve going forward. Okay. Um, now, you, you talked a little bit about it when you talked a little bit about the mission command ideas and, and the differences between a human in the loop concept. Are you able to um, give us a little bit more information on the, the sort of military applications the Chinese are looking at for AI? And, and what I mean by that, do, do you expect it to be more intelligence roles, uh, analytical roles, uh, weapon guidance roles, or are we going to start seeing uh, you know, terminators? So I'm not here to tell you that the Chinese military is about to unleash killer robots on the battlefield. I think that well, that's is... a good thing, I think. <laughs> yes. So uh, sci-fi fans may be a little bit disappointed there, but I think in many respects the that uh, hype has sometimes dominated the discussion, whereas I think a lot of the impactful military applications of AI in the foreseeable future will be a little bit less exciting or glamorous, so to speak, in terms of a lot of perhaps seemingly more mundane contexts in which introducing machine learning, deep learning, and other types of AI uh, could result in great increases in efficiency and speed. So, uh, And the PLA seems to be pursuing a number of the same military applications that the U.S. and uh, other militaries are, but sometimes different in its degree of focus. So to give you an initial listing of what I've come across so far, of the PLA seems likely to leverage AI to increase uh, the degree of autonomy of intelligent unmanned systems, including UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned ground vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles, all sorts of unmanned systems that are progressing towards greater degrees of, a of, of autonomy. And for instance, uh, if you go to the military museum in Beijing, there is a there is a small depiction of several swarms uh, attacking an aircraft carrier. So swarm intelligence is something that both the U.S. and China have been developing. There's been an interesting uh, dynamic where China has one-upped the U.S. by demonstrating larger swarms than the, uh, U than the U.S. Department of Defense has on several occasions. Of course, size doesn't quite matter as much as the sophistication of algorithms here, perhaps, but that's been a pretty clear sign that Swarms are something that the PLA is working on and looking to use. Concepts of man-to-man -man teaming and multi-drone multi, uh, operations will also sort of fall under this rough category. And then in the context of intelligence, there's a, qu quite a number of contexts in which AI could be quite useful, uh, data fusion, information processing, and intelligence analysis. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the development of an algorithm that could identify particular targets of interest from massive amounts of imagery or video data. Uh, the PLA is also uh, perhaps a little bit different from the U.S. military, seeming to focus quite a bit on the use of AI in wargaming simulation and even training. So the, the PLA, in many respects, uh, lacks actual combat experience, and they've struggled to make their training more realistic and improve the level of, level of sophistication, and AI can potentially help there if you can introduce virtual and augmented reality, or if you can even use AI to develop an intelligent blue force, so their equivalent of a red team, mm -hmm. in a sense, to fight against, to increase the realism. And there have already been some efforts in China to introduce AI in, into war games in order to both develop more sophisticated AI that can engage in those sorts of decision making, at least in a simpler context, and to start to try to test out some of the dynamics of an, of AI in the future battlefield. And then uh, also perhaps a feasible near-term application will be the use of AI in defense, offense, and command and information warfare, including a psychological warfare, electronic warfare, for instance, cognitive EW, and as I mentioned, cyber operations. Then finally, uh, another major focus for the PLA seems to be use of AI to support command decision-making or the intelligentization or of command decision-making to essentially attempt to leverage AI to improve commanders' ability to make decisions 
rapidly and mm -hmm. correctly on the battlefield. So there's a sense that AI could provide almost an external brain for the commander. And the, this uh, latter category was something that has received particular attention since AlphaGo, which was both a Sputnik moment of sorts for China in terms of the significance of AI as a technology and in terms of its military potential, that you could have an AI defeating the top human champions in the game of Go, which is, of course, not warfare, but in certain respects requires complex strategizing that is not too unlike the decisions a commander would have to make. So that AlphaGo uh, provoked a lot of speculation among PLA thinkers that could AI at some point take on a similar role in warfare and come up with new, new tactics and stratagems that a human commander might never think of and make better decisions? And then, of course, there will also be, I mean, if you go off of the analogy that AI is, electri is like electricity, it will sort of could supercharge just about any, any domain of society or of a military organization. There yeah. will also be a lot of things like logistics and human resource management where militaries could start to use machine learning, deep learning, and even just better, better mustering of big data to to generally increase their ability to operate more efficiency, more efficiently, and could, could have quite an impact there as well. So that's a bit of a lengthy an answer, but I think it's certainly clear that the PLA is funding quite a few projects involving different AI techniques and applications. And a lot of this is in the research and development stage at the moment, but will continue to progress in the years to come. Well, it, it's good that they're are not necessarily going to be killer robots on the battlefield tomorrow. Um, but it seems that it doesn't matter which country is looking into AI, they're looking uh, in, a, in a broad range of uh, capabilities for military use. Now, your paper talks about the Chinese concept for AI um, and how it compares to the US um, third offset. Uh, you talked about it a little bit before, but I'm just wondering, is there a, is there a, 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 a way that we can uh, state quite clearly the US concept for AI differs from the Chinese concept AI because they aim to, is it just the human in the loop factor? Is it uh, are linking more to an, uh, the uh, ethical components of conflict or is it, what is the, what is the crux of the difference between the two? So I'd say that there are a couple of major differences that appear to be mer emerging so far. So to return to one of my earlier points, I think for China, there could be a structural advantage in leveraging, rap, rapidly leveraging advances in a technology for which the locus of innovation is in the private sector rather than the tr traditional defense industry, given that China is pursuing a strategy of military civil fusion at the national level to try to enable the more effective leveraging of some of the synergies between civilian and military advances, whereas the U.S. and and other nations may have further difficulties in in uh, optimizing their model of public-private par pri private partnership. It, China could potentially have structural advantages given the much closer linkages between military and civilian efforts in this domain. Of course, there will be obstacles there as well, but there does seem to be quite a powerful impetus at the highest levels to Xi Jinping himself to advancing this agenda. Yeah. I think a second thing, uh, would say that the Chinese concept of intelligentization, which is an awkward, untranslatable Chinese term that I seems to mean something along the lines of incorporating AI into relevant applications, uh, just as uh, the Chinese concept of informatization, which uh, was in response to U.S. network-centric warfare to some degree, reflected their efforts to develop C4 ISR systems and introduce information technology throughout the force. So I think this concept and its expansiveness and the broad range and scope of efforts uh, seems to differ a little bit from what the U.S. Department of Defense is doing, given that U.S. efforts seem to be focused a little bit more narrowly and tactically. Uh, so, for instance, developing algorithms that could be deployed on the battlefield by the end of this year. So the uh, U.S. Department of Defense is moving very quickly, but there seems to be a little bit of a narrower focus so far, whereas the... PLA seems to be thinking about intelligentization as a force-wide endeavor. I'd say that 
uh, there will also be some major differences between how uh, the Chinese military relative to the U.S. and other militaries could think about human capital in this context. So this has traditionally been a relative shortcoming for the PLA, one that they've very avidly tried to redress through recruiting better educated and trained officers and enlisted personnel. I think the PLA uh, still recognizes that this could be a major weakness and could in some cases try to use AI to compensate for that, but it could underestimate some of the human factors challenges that might arise in that introducing automation, autonomy, and any sort of complex system involving AI could seem to obviate the need for very skilled humans, but in some cases you might actually place greater demands upon humans to be very well trained and technically, technically proficient to use and interact with these highly complex systems. So that's uh, how the PLA response to these challenges could be quite different from the US, which mm -hmm. sees humans as its number one advantage. Yeah. And then I think, uh, in, in, in addition, as I mentioned, I think the question of humans in the loop, beyond the basic question of what, what does and will that mean in different contexts, I think, could be an area of divergence. So I think a little bit too early to tell how how that will play out in different organizational contexts. The PLA also seems to be focusing on things like human machine teaming and collaboration that the US has pursued. Yeah. And and going forward, I think another overarching question will be to what extent will the PLA uh, respect and adhere to legal constraints and frameworks in its use of AI and warfare. Uh, in certain contexts, China has seemed to be pursuing more, more of an approach of legal warfare than seeing the law as a constraint. So I think this could be an area where engagement uh, on what, on how you apply international law and the laws of armed conflict to autonomous weapons and to and more broadly to address questions of operational risk that might arise with AI uh, could be an important area of engagement and another thing to keep an eye on going forward. It, it all sounds kind of awesome, um, not just because I'm a massive sci-fi fan, but also it looks like we might actually have to use Asimov's three laws of robotics uh, in the future, um, which will mean that it's not just in Will Smith movies but or wicked science fiction books, but it may be actually, my computer may have a law that stops it from hurting me, which is cool, because at the moment... We'll see. Well, yeah, at the moment, me and my computer have a bit of a love-hate relationship, but because this sounds really cool, uh, and it seems like the, the US and Chinese are, are similar in some ways, and, and also they're exploring a, a couple of different areas very interestingly, where should our listeners be watching for the most exciting developments? Well, I think it depends on one's definition of exciting. I think that certainly th this is a very dynamic domain, and th which has made my research challenging, given yeah. how quickly things are evolving. I think, certainly, as I mentioned, it will be interesting to see how U.S. and Chinese approaches continue to evolve. And if you, I will, yeah, certainly as making any predictions about the future of warfare is a hazardous endeavor. Yeah. And yet, I think there clearly is a very real possibility that AI could transform the character of conflict as we know it. Excellent. And if, if you look back at the prior revolution in military affairs, the U.S. was the one who was pioneering new ways of warfare. It was developing and demonstrating new operational concepts and able to achieve a an initially close to undisputed advantage based on being the first to succeed in, in this regard. So I think the question now will be, there's a much more level playing field between the U.S. and China in terms of technology. In, both in artificial intelligence and in other emerging domains, such as quantum technologies and also biotechnology. Yeah. So if, if uh, there are new ways of warfare that could change current paradigms of military power, the question I would raise will be who will get there first, so to speak, or who will be the first to develop the appropriate operational concepts and perhaps new organizational structures, and who will be able to both develop the technology and also have the organizational capacity to implement 
and effectively make use of it. And I think I think at this point it's still an open question. And I suppose the uh, clickbait version of my research would be U.S.-China AI arms race. I would tend to resist that characterization because I think clearly this is a much more complex domain. There are there are dimensions of cooperation and competition between the U.S. and China in this technology, as in of any other dimension of the relationship. And yet I think it's clear that there is uh, intensifying military competition focused upon the implementation of defense and military innovation in this context. And the Chinese military appears to believe that they have an opportunity to leapfrog the U.S. and be the first to discover the win mechanism and stratagems for intelligence-sized warfare. I think that remains to be seen, and I think it will be a exciting, so to speak, a question to consider going forward. But there also could be considerable risks associated with this sort of competition. Since in some cases, despite uh, the a lot of the excitement about rapid advances in AI, this technology still has a number of limitations. It's hard to know how to test it appropriately if they're if you do potentially take a human out of the loop in certain contexts, it's hard to know, will there be mechanisms and safeguards to mitigate mistakes that might arise? Yeah. Uh, right now, um, computer vision algorithms can sometimes be tricked by changes to a single pixel, or there, there are ways to fool AI and think about what will psychological warfare against AI look like? Will there be ways that Interesting. U- US-China and other militaries will try to manipulate and undermine the integrity of each other's AI systems. There's been some discussion so far on both sides and counter AI capabilities of how do you spoof, fool, or otherwise confuse AI and or AI plus humans. How do you sort of wage the psychological warfare against that combination? And I think that will be both fascinating and potentially highly risky if there are capabilities are being developed to that it would attempt to make these systems malfunction in ways that could be highly unpredictable yeah that's wow it's i said exciting developments and you now my brain hurts so that's uh, <laughs> that's excellent um now elsa i would love to sit here and talk about uh, so, uh science fiction or AI all day. Um, I note that you've kept to the facts and I've kept to the science fiction, which is actually probably good because you know about the facts and I'm a geek. But I need to... Ask, I'm also a geek. Well, you'd have to be, I think, if you speak fluent Mandarin and study uh, AI developments in China. I don't think there's any other label for you. Um, Indeed. <laughs> apart from super intelligent, um, you may be an AI program itself. Uh, just so listeners know out there, I'm, I'm, I haven't confirmed that Elsa's human. Um, well, you never know. <laughs> I will neither confirm nor deny any allegations in that regard. My final question is one every guest gets on the show, and it relates to our mission to define war in as many ways possible, just like Big Carl, the dead Prussian himself, not your ancestor, the other one. And it is about creating a debate and a conversation so that we can understand uh, this uh, human uh, condition known as war. Although ants and chimps also fight. So I ask each guest to finish the sentence, war is. So, Elsa, now I'm asking you to finish the sentence, war is. Hmm. So perhaps an obvious answer given the focus of my research, but I would say that perhaps war is changing. The character, that is, not the nature. I think the human element of warfare will remain equally, if not more important than ever as machines take on a greater role on the battlefield. But I think it's clear that we could be at, a, at an inflection point where there's, there have been rapid exponential increases in a range of emerging technologies, AI among them. But if you look at things like CRISPR or the potential advent of quantum technologies, which is a whole other domain of my research that is equally sci-fi and equally fascinating. So I think it, it's certainly hard to predict whether and to what extent these emerging uh, strategic frontier by the Chinese characterization technologies could could change the character of conflict and could result in broader transformation of warfare as we know it. Of course, there can be no shortage of hype associated with 
emerging technologies. It's an exciting set of issues to be looking at. And it's, and of course, there's a possibility that the impact could be less transformative than, than expectations or that the hype could overtake the reality of what is feasible. But I think certainly uh, war, war itself uh, will not fundamentally change. And yet, I think there is a very real possibility that within our lifetimes, we could see things that are much more reminiscent of science fiction actually happening on the battlefield. So I will leave it with that. Excellent. War is changing. That is a new one, uh, which is good, uh, because I like new ones because I can tweet them and, and they're new for the listeners. Uh, Elsa, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. Now, listeners, you uh, can read Elsa's uh, paper over at the uh, Centre for New American Security website, which is cnas.org. Uh, Org, I think I'll double check that uh, Earl right now uh, and you can also follow Elsa on Twitter at uh, E.B. Kania correction E.B. Kania I, pr- I practice that a lot listeners I still got it wrong it is E.B. K.A.N.I.A just blame my Aussie accent and I was right about the Earl it is a cnas.org that's where you can find uh, Elsa's paper uh, and also, listeners, you would have heard that uh, we are on a season break for the other show, War for Idiots. Don't worry. Uh, Richie and I will be back in some form or another, but make sure you jump onto uh, our website. Uh, check out uh, thedeadprussian.com. You can find a heap of information about the show and other things. And you can also, if you are a, a member of the TDP community, you can jump on our blog and jump on our a member forum uh, where we will be discussing AI, which is actually the hot topic at the moment and probably will be for a while, and talk about all things uh, AI, revolutions, US third offset and Chinese military revolutions. But until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod on Facebook at The Dead Prussian page or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode as well as copyright information can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.